Hello, hello to our faithful family. Um, we are back today and we are going to be talking about circadian health. So what does that mean? It means circadian rhythms. Um, it means, um, sorry, just one second. I'm just trying to get Dr. Mbizvo, who's our special guest today, to join us. One second, there we go. He's speaking to medical doctor and yoga teacher, Dr. Anesu Mbizvo, and she's gonna be taking us through circadian health. And so what that really means is we're gonna be talking about sleep and how important sleep is and the things that we can do throughout our day and our schedule to help us sleep better. We're gonna be covering off supplements. We're gonna be talking about behaviors that either help or hinder our circadian rhythms, which helps um, in turn helps us improve or kind of not improve our sleep. So I just seem to be having a little bit of difficulty getting Dr. Mbizvo to join us. Just one second, guys. There we go, just invited her again. For some reason, Instagram decided to cancel my invitation. Uh, I'm saying she's unable to join. Okay, one second guys. Let's just try and get her again. Sure, technology here. Hey? Maybe it's load shedding. <laughs> So just one second. Okay, I'm sent to another invitation. There we go. Hopefully she'll accept this one and we can get started talking about sleep. You can see I haven't slept particularly well. Look at those dark circles. Oh no. <laughs> I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what Dr. Mbizwell has for us in terms of um, opportunities to improve that. Okay, so just one second, guys. Just going to ask Dr. Mbizwa to send me an invitation. Um, okay. Um, there we go. Trying to see if we can get a different way to do this from a technology point of view. Oh dear. Um, so, Dr. Mbeswal, if you are listening, could you send me a request? I'm going to just, just give me a second here, guys. Sorry, I'm like a little bit technologically challenged. Let's see, hopefully this one is the magic opportunity. There we go. Um, I see we have lots and lots of people joining today, which is fantastic. So obviously lots of people interested in finding out more about sleep and circadian health, just like me. Um, hopefully we can get our expert on in just a second. Just give me one more try to speak to her. Hello. Hi, Hi Anna. I'm sorry. I thought out the technical issues. Yes. 
are you able to see me on my on my screen it looks like the bottom half is not showing my video no unfortunately you can't see you is there any sure so what you possibly do is um you could exit and then okay. send me a request to join you send you a request okay let me do that thanks Right. So in the meantime, guys, um, one of the questions that I have for Dr. and Liz Vaughan, remember these, these sessions are very interactive. So there really is an opportunity for you to drop in your questions as well. So please do send in your questions. Um, we would love to hear from you in the live. Um, there was an opportunity to send before, but if you didn't have that opportunity, don't stress. You can still send questions in the live. Some of the things that I'll be asking Dr. and Liz Vaughan today are what is circadian health? Why is it important? Um, what does sleep do for our overall um, health? Um, what are some of the supplements to support better sleep? And here we go. We have Dr. B joining us again. Hello, can you see me and hear me? And so we can hear you, but unfortunately we can't seem to see you. So I don't know if there's bandwidth issue on your side or. Yeah, that's bizarre. I'm, I'm in a co-working space with great Wi-Fi, and I've never had this issue on Instagram before. I've done quite a few shared lives. Um, shall we try it one more time, Lorna? Sorry to everyone who's joined us. I have no idea why you aren't able to see me. Can we try it one more time where I exit and then. I'll send you the request. Fantastic. Let's do that. Thank okay. you. And thanks okay. for your patience. Really appreciate it. It's always, it's never great when we have these technical issues. But I do think the conversation we're going to get to um, is when, when we finally sort out these technical issues is going to be really, really interesting. Um, in particular, I'm quite interested. Um, oh, so Bradley, just to answer your question, um, you can just drop your question in the comments. So where it says comment, you can just type your questions in there and we'll try and get to them throughout. Um, what I would suggest is that we may not be able to get to all of the questions um, kind of through the live because obviously we, we've got sort of structured questions to lead the conversation. Um, but there'll definitely be a chance at the end. So if we haven't, feel free to drop your question in whenever, but if we haven't gotten to it, um, there will be an opportunity again at the end to drop it in um, if you have any specific questions about sleep um, and circadian health in general, um, which basically regulates our sleep-wake cycles. But let me not steal Dr. Anessa's thunder. She's definitely more qualified to talk on this topic than I am. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, guys, I'm, I'm just getting some advice um, from... Okay, so Dr. Beasel says she's spoken to the team, they're fixing their modem, so we'll be good to go. So let's just keep going. I, I don't want to switch off the live, and really apologies, yeah, apologies from Dr. Anesu and from myself as well. Sorry, guys. Technology, but... Um, and then just for those of you that aren't aware, um, so this has been part of a series in which we've really been delving into trends that we found interesting um, going into 2023. So some of the topics we've already explored are around greenwashing. And we had that conversation with the lovely Zandi the Mermaid that joined us. Um, we've also spoken about the link between nervous system health and metabolic health. And that conversation was with Dr. Daphne Lyle, who's a functional medicine doctor. Um, we also spoke about making your mental health a daily practice. So in the same way that we do things for our physical health on a daily basis, how do we do things for our mental health on a daily, on a daily basis? And that conversation was with Dr. Jess Stanbridge. Um, and then we also had a conversation around hormonal health, um, which was really fascinating, probably a bit more relevant to our female audience members. And that was where with um, Claire Yulsing Stradom, who is a dietitian specializing in PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian um, syndrome. But we spoke about cortisol, we spoke about PCOS, we spoke about menopause. So lots of really interesting stuff for especially women in terms of how hormones affect our um, 
our health at different life stages. Today, we're talking about circadian health with Dr. Anesu Mbizbo, who is a medical doctor and yoga teacher. And our last conversation will be on Thursday, and we're going to be talking about clean beauty. And specifically, we're going to get really, really deep into what are the no-nos, what are the good ingredients. So what are the not-so-good ingredients that we want to avoid in traditional products? What are the fantastic natural ingredients that are going to give us plump, beautiful skin, glow, glowing skin? Um, and we'll be joined by the chemist, the senior chemist from Squin. And Squin is a fantastic locally founded clean beauty brand that we proudly stock on Faithful to Nature. It's woman founded just like us. Um, so it's really wonderful to have Rukeya Mansour, who is the chemist at Squin, joining us on Thursday. So if you are interested in beauty or more specifically clean beauty, I think that's going to be really an interesting conversation with Rukaya, sorry, Rukaya, where we delve into, um, like I said, the, the, the good ingredients, the not so good ingredients, the ingredients you really want to avoid, um, what makes clean beauty special, and also just some of the common misconceptions around clean beauty. So is it as effective? Absolutely, it can be as effective. Um, and, you know, so that's all what we're going to be delving into next week with, um, on Thursday, sorry, at 6 p.m. Hello, success at last. Finally. <laughs> Hi, it is so lovely to see you. Oh, I'm so glad. I think it's apt that we are speaking about sleep because after all of this, I'm probably going to need some of my own advice to follow. <laughs> Thank you for your patience, both to you and everybody watching. Thank you. Very I'm so happy to be here. Appreciate it. It's wonderful. So, Anesu, um, I'm going to just jump straight in, and it would be really great. Um, I've, I've already talked you up, but <laughs> I think it's always better for people to kind of know who you are in your own words. So if you could just give us a quick um, intro to who you are, um, and then we can get straight into the really interesting questions around circadian health. Perfect. So. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Anesu. I am a medical doctor by training, but my own experiences with my own well-being, my own mental state when I was practicing as a doctor, really led me to explore more alternative and holistic viewpoints of healing. So I am a qualified yoga teacher, a real advocate for mental well-being practices, and I like to live the entirety of my life in a way that is conscious and intentional, be it the things that I consume, the people I interact with, how I behave on a day-to-day -day basis. And that has led me into working for myself. That became, I think, the career path that spoke more innately to who I am as a person. So I run a little boutique wellness center called The Nest Space which is all about inclusive wellness, showing each and everybody that regardless of your culture, your gender, your physical ability, that well-being and wellness is for you and that it is for everybody. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, I've had the ability to work with so many incredible brands and I think almost all of them are on the Faithful to Nature website or part of the beautiful collective that you have. So I'm just really grateful to be speaking to you tonight, Lorna, and to be having a conscious conversation about an aspect of health that I think not many of us understand, but that really affects each and every part of our lives. Fantastic. That's an, an amazing introduction and I think really encapsulates why we were also so interested to speak to you, Anesu, um, because we're really interested in your conscious approach to health and well-being and absolutely love the inclusive aspect as well so right let's start talking about circadian health so i think let's first define it um so what is circadian health and why is it important mm. so the word circadian and when we talk about circadian health this all has to do with our circadian rhythm so each and every animal insect and of course human beings have a rhythm that they follow on a day-to-day -day basis that essentially dictates 
our bodily functions and mirrors how our body is functioning internally to what should be going on externally. And so when we talk about our circadian rhythm, it's a rhythm that our body follows over a 24 hour period that dictates certain hormones that are released, certain bodily functions that are taking place that are supposed to help us internally work at a way that really helps us to move through our days optimally and from a point of balance. And that's really what circadian health is about. Obviously, a big part of our day is spent sleeping <laughs> and resting. And so that's often what gets a lot of screen time when we talk about circadian health um, with regards to our sleep, the quality of our sleep, etc. But that flows into the rest of the 24-hour cycle. And what's really important about circadian health is understanding that the time that you spend asleep is setting you up for the time that you spend awake and really understanding how you can essentially enhance the rhythm that your body is following throughout that 24 hour period. And just to add to that, um, Anesu, in, in the same way that your sleep enhances the period that you're awake, I think what you do when you're awake, and I think that's what we're going to get into, can also affect the quality of your sleep later. And I think that's what the study of circadian um, rhythm is so interesting, and that's why we wanted to talk about this trend, because there's really a lot of tangible things that may not seem that obvious to begin with that people can actually do to improve quality of their sleep right from when they wake up in the morning throughout their day to when they actually sort of start winding down into their sleep routine. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. So. How is, so, and you did mention that like circadian rhythms and circadian health definitely talks too much more. It's, it's sleep wake cycles. So it's more than just sleep. But I think for a lot of people on the live with us, sleep is of particular importance. You know, things like anxiety keep us up. Um, you know, screens are keeping us up. Um, we definitely, uh, I think there are studies that show that, that have measured the amount of time that people are sleeping compared to 50 years ago, for example. And there's definitely, I think society is sleeping less. Yes. So how is sleep an important contributor to wellness? Because I think this is also something that's sort of emerged really in the last few years where, you know, in the 80s, People used to focus on fitness in sort of the 90s and 2000s they started adding nutrition and really now as we kind of proceed we're adding more and more to this picture of what wellness looks like and sleep is one of those things that we're adding so why is sleep important for health mm. i love that question and i think for me that the biggest way to understand how sleep impacts your life is by considering ourselves as living a life of balance so most of the time, like you say, when we talk about well-being, we focus on one side of the seesaw of balance, if you want to put it that way. We focus on what we can do to become more healthy, more fit in terms of our diet, our exercise routine, but we neglect the other half of the seesaw, where we talk about how much time and how much effort we put into our rest. And sleep is a hugely important part of our day because it's the time where our body one recuperates for the activities that we have had during our day so if you've had a very active day with during your sleep cycle that's generally where your muscles will go into recovery mode to help you to prevent injury it's generally a time where our digestive system is given a break because often when we're awake that's when we're eating our digestive system is on a go 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 type of cycle and so sleep is a moment where our digestive system manages to rest. And this has to do with a lot of different organs within the body. We notice that we breathe deeper. Our heart rate is slower when we are sleeping, which also means that our hearts, our lungs are given space to recuperate from all of the work that they've been doing. But I think perhaps more importantly, the brain really gets as much of it can of that restful period when we're sleeping. And what we tend to find when it comes to brain activity is that throughout our day, regardless of whether you are having a day off or you're having a very busy time at the office, 
our brain is always taking in various stimuli that prevent it from simply recharging, restoring, and relaxing. And so we end up starting off our day with a lot of sensory input coming into our nervous system, and our brain has to use all of our energy in order to dictate what decisions we make, what paths we choose, and it doesn't really have an opportunity to simply breathe. And what that looks like on a physiological level is our brain is pumping out a variety of different hormones that then affect different bodily functions. And so when we sleep, this is an opportunity for our brain, our neurotransmitters, which are the chemicals within our brains that send signals to different parts of the body to be absorbed, to be refueled. It's, if you imagine the, the tank of your car, for example, as your, your bank for your neurotransmitters, you often are at an empty tank by the end of the day, and that's why we feel fatigued, and that's why we feel tired. And so when we sleep, it's almost like a refueling. We get those hormones restocked, our neurotransmitters are either absorbed or released if they need to be. And so our, for our brains especially, sleep is extremely vital for us to be able to function on the day-to-day. -day. And what we find is because of the fact that people are not adequately shutting off or sleeping for a long enough time, our, their brains are not given an adequate amount of downtime in order to self-regulate. And so you end up starting off your day not having cleared away what you need to clear away, excreted what it is you need to excrete, and you end up starting off your day almost on an empty tank, if we're keeping with that analogy, which of course has a detrimental effect on the decisions you make and how your day goes moving forward. So sleep is hugely important. So I'm going to throw a little curveball here, but um, of course the million dollar question that everybody wants to know is how much sleep is enough sleep? <laughs> yeah, that's a difficult question. You know, there's so there's a lot of research about sleep, but there's also not enough. So yeah. I think what we're starting to see now, and I think it's in all spheres of life, is instead of having a sort of one all-encompassing approach to everybody that prescribes a certain amount of sleep that you need, we're starting to see a more individualistic take on sleep. So a lot of resources from a research done further back would of course say eight hours a day is how much every single person needs of sleep in order to feel ready and energized. But newer research is starting to show that depending on your personality type, depending on your circadian rhythm, your personal circadian rhythm, different people might be able to get by on more or less sleep than others. And so there's a variety of different texts that say that certain people can survive on five hours of sleep. There's a variety of texts that say that some people need longer than eight hours, nine to 10 hours of sleep. And so I think with the risk of sounding very wishy-washy and, and mm -hmm. broad, I think it's really important to start to consider your own reaction to the amount of sleep that you're having. And I find that taking an individualistic approach to our health and almost everything and starting to be more observant, more conscious and more intentional of taking stock of what you need is probably the best way to go. And I think we, we are all quite connected to that intuitively. You know, I'm very aware that I'm one of those people who needs seven to eight hours of sleep. If I have any less than that, I'm not coping, but my partner is quite the opposite. You know, he sleeps for about five to six hours and he seems energized and ready to go. So if you were holding a gun to my head, which of course you're not, Lorna, I think eight hours of sleep as a general statement, but it really comes down to understanding your own body's rhythm the best. Yeah. And I think that that's... Um... You know, that's such great advice that goes beyond just the topic of sleep, which is listen to your body, right? Because I think that the more research that we find, the more we realize that health is definitely not one size fits all. And so general guidelines obviously do apply because we're all humans. But within that, there's a lot of nuance. And the best way for you to figure out what works for you is really just to tune into yourself and listen to yourself. And I think that's that's really fantastic advice. So sorry to put you on the block. And I, I see that comments coming through about quantity of sleep and quality of sleep and 
I know we hadn't specifically asked about that in the prep, but it, it would be really interesting if you're able to speak to the different cycles that we go through during the sleep process and how important those are. I mean, I think most of us are sort of vaguely aware of the fact that there's like deep sleep and REM. Mm, yes. I think I've kind of looked out of my depth here, so I'll hand over to you. <laughs> yes. So in terms of the different phases that we go through with regards to the sleep cycle, it really has to do with the waves or the frequency at which our brain is functioning. So a good way to understand it, and I always like to use analogies when we talk about health, because I think the terminology can get a little bit confusing mm. sometimes. I think the best way to describe how our brain works is to use the analogy of music and vibration, right? And so when we hear music that is of a higher frequency, that's usually music of a higher pitch or a higher tone, that's very different to when we hear music with a lower frequency, a longer sound wave, for example, which has more of a deeper frequency and tone to it. And so what we see during the sleep cycle is that our brain waves change form. They go from a high frequency into a lower frequency and then up again and they rotate. And so there are different names for that. That's also where it gets a bit confusing. The high frequency waves are known as alpha waves, alpha brain waves. We then have beta brain waves as well. And that relates to whether we are in a shallow level of sleep, whether we are in a deep level of sleep, or whether we are in REM sleep. And REM is almost what I like to call the passage from a shallow sleep into a deeper state of sleep where it's rapid eye movement is essentially the terminology for REM. That's what REM essentially spells out. And the reason why we have rapid eye movement is because our brain is moving from a state where we are digesting, analyzing what it is that may have happened before we slept. That's generally a state of shallow sleep or those alpha brain waves. We then move into REM where our body it's still flickering, our muscles are still active, but our brain waves are going to a slightly lower frequency. And then we move into that deep layer of sleep where there is no eye movement, where the body is completely still and we're able to relax. And there've been a lot of research um, studies done about when it is that we dream. So a lot of research says that REM sleep is usually the state where if you remember sleeping, that's usually the phase of sleep where you're dreaming. Um, but that's still to be shown. It's not an exact science. Um, and it's quite interesting, though, because our, our REM sleep is a very short period of time. It's, it's a matter of minutes. And so the studies show that when we dream, even though we might feel like we're dreaming for hours, we're actually dreaming within that very condensed period of time of REM sleep. And so it's just, I find, such an interesting way of understanding that our brains move at a totally different pace to what we imagine them to. And it's a really intricate system that is supposed to help you to, one, deconstruct the day that you've had, allow your body to release what it is you need to release before going into that deep state where you are in full relaxation and your brain has also switched off and relaxed. Well, so I guess one way of knowing if you really transitioned into that deep sleep is remembering if you dreamed. Because yes. <laughs> that, 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 that sort of rapid eye movement is that transition to that truly deep rest, which is so fantastic for our bodies and our brains, our guts, all of which are kind of really key. Um, thank you for that. That was really, really interesting. So I guess the next sign or the next question is a bit more practical. So I think we now understand the theory around circadian rhythms, how they affect us, what's important about sleep, how sleep works. How do we know if our circadian rhythms are off? Great question. I think the best way to know that your circadian rhythm is off is generally you'll start to feel certain symptoms either before going into sleep or upon waking up. So if your circadian rhythm is off, the things that you will notice before going to sleep are a struggle to go to sleep at the usual time that you might. You might even start to feel uncomfortable emotions around the time of sleeping. I've, I've heard of people talking about feeling frustrated, irritable, uh, just generally on their last nerve. That can be a sign that your circadian rhythm is off. And then, of course, struggling to fall asleep and then waking up 
while sleeping is another sign that your circadian rhythm is not up to scratch. That's interesting. So, so interrupted sleep. Yes, yes, exactly. You don't have a newborn in the house. <laughs> <laughs> if there's, well, I think, I think you could safely say that having a newborn in the house is probably a sure sign that your yeah. circadian rhythm is off. <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean I, if there's not that external prompt and exactly. you know you interrupt it then then that's kind of good so, so that's really helpful so crankiness before bed or kind of uncomfortable emotions which in my word is crankiness mm -hmm. I suppose um, interrupt and then possibly also uh, waking up feeling not rest exactly. okay so waking up feeling unrested again emotions are really important here because I think a lot of the time we struggle to recognize what fatigue feels like because we're in a chronic state of fatigue due to stress and our modern day living so your emotions can be a really useful tool for you to understand whether you are tired or not with, without you actually feeling the sensation of tiredness so if you are feeling cranky, bitter, irritable, depressed is another one um, in the morning, and there's no real explanation for that, that can also be a key sign to say, okay, my circadian rhythm is off. And then to follow on from that, if you start having periods of drowsiness, of falling asleep um, in front of the computer screen during work hours, or just inappropriately, feeling like you're drifting off, that can also be a sign that your circadian rhythm is not quite where it should be. Okay. So I guess then the, the logical question following on from that is, so now we, we understand sleep, we understand circadian rhythms, we understand um, how to tell if our circadian rhythms are off. So if they're off, how do we fix them? Mm. And I mean, obviously we understand that this is speaking generally, I understand that there's a lot of science around treating patients individually, health as individuals. So obviously just for everybody out there, please know that Anesu is speaking generally and not specifically because there may be very specific factors involved in every single case. So I think this is just really to kind of help everybody understand what are the general things that all of us could probably benefit from in terms of trying to improve our circadian rhythms. So I think the first thing to start looking is to almost take a stock of what your daily routine looks like from waking all the way to falling asleep. And you'll generally start to notice a couple of things that might be causing an issue with your circadian rhythm. So of course, if we start off, we've woken up and that's where our starting point will be and we'll kind of go as we go along. Generally observing what you take in in the first few hours after waking. So the first three hours after waking are an extremely important time. And if you notice that you are taking a lot of caffeine, you're needing external stimulants, for example, to get yourself going, that can be something that is a sure sign to, to, to be affecting your circadian rhythm. So it's really about noticing what you're taking in at those times caffeine of course i think we all know its job is to keep you awake so if you are having high levels of caffeine particularly right after sleeping that actually impacts your circadian rhythm more than it does if you have let's say a cup of coffee later on in the morning or around lunchtime so be very aware mm, very interesting that the timing of your coffee actually affects your body differently wow once you go yeah. through your day and you look at the foods that you are eating, how many stimulants you are maybe putting into your body, that obviously becomes a situation where you can decide to cut down. I prefer to say to cut down slowly. I'm not, I'm not someone who advocates for going cold turkey, no more coffee, absolutely nothing, but maybe just cutting down bit by bit so that you eventually reach a state where you're having one cup of coffee in the late morning as opposed to having three cups right after waking up. So I think noticing the amounts of stimulants that you are having, remember stimulants can come in the form of nicotine when it comes to smoking as well. Um, high levels of sugar content, if you're having very sugary breakfasts, for example, that can also be causing an issue with your circadian health. So taking stock of what it is you consume, particularly in the mornings, can be a really useful uh, guide to you understanding what it is that you need to change. 
as we move through the rest of the day, midday, we're kind of okay. Um, if you are experiencing a lot of tiredness, I'm very much an advocate for a 30 minute power nap, or I advocate for a yoga nidra, which is translated as yogic sleep. It's a guided meditation that is specifically to help you get an intense period of sleep within a short amount of time. Maybe think about adding that into your midday routine around lunchtime, just to give you that extra boost that you may require. And then towards the evening, and this is, I think, where the real crux of sleep hygiene, as it's called, comes in, really observing what your evening routine looks like. So we spoke at the beginning, Lorna, a little bit around the fact that our brain is taking in lots of different stimuli during the day, and sleep is a time where our brain gets to rest. And what's interesting about the brain is depending on the light of, of whatever it is that we're taking into the day, the quality of the light that we're taking in, that stimulates different parts of the brain and brings about a different physiological response. So there's a lot of talk around blue light versus red light. And blue light is actually, um, that, that stimuli is actually interpreted by a different part of our retina, the part of the eye that actually takes in light as opposed to red light. It's a completely part of a different part of the retina that takes that in. And so if you notice towards the end of your day that you're watching a lot of TV, you have uh, your iPad or your phone open, you're scrolling through social media, our digital devices emit a lot of blue light. And that mm -hmm. blue light stimulates, obviously, that blue part of the retina, if you want to call it that, which sends a message to the brain that we need to be alert, we need to be active, we need to be ready, as opposed to a softer red light, which is similar to the color that a candle flame would emit, a warm light bulb would emit, for example, you can also put that sitting onto your phone. That source of light emits a completely different response within your neurological system. So I think becoming aware, not just of your devices, perhaps, but even the light sources in your home. Is it a very bright fluorescent light that you have at your reading lamp, as opposed to perhaps reading by candlelight, which most of us have to do with load shedding nowadays. That can also be a really good indicator um, when it comes to your bedtime routine of things that you need to change. And of course, no caffeine coming closer to bedtime. Try to stay away from alcohol and other stimulant there. And also just take in information that is soothing for you. If you're reading a book, make sure that it's a book that brings about happy emotions. You know, a lot of the time we say, put down your phone and pick up a book. But if you're reading about, I don't know, serial killers and all sorts of things, you're not going to get the response that you want. So a lot of it is quite logical, but I think um, what I really want to put across is that even though it sounds like common sense or things that are old wives' tales that we've heard before, there's actually a lot of very intricate, complex nuance that happens within our brains that responds to these habits that are actually quite simple to change. And I think what's interesting is that, you know, with all of the um, science and research tools that are available today, um, a lot of these old wives tales, if you want to call it that, have been proven to be, have a solid basis in science, you know, so, um, and I, I think it's, it, it, it is logical to a certain extent, but I think it, it also, um, understanding the science underlying it does kind of, I think, help us with, especially in our rational minds, <laughs> be clearer around why we should make those choices. So kind of more soothing content around us towards bedtime, really focusing on how much light we're taking in both in our environment and through our screens. Blue light is a no-no. Um, sort of focusing rather on warming kind of like red light, which is going to help our bodies settle into sleep more. Um, and I, I always think about it, you know, I, I'm a mom and I have little ones, not so little anymore, but, you know, I, I was always at pains to get that sleep routine right for them when they were little, you know, it was like the bath yeah. and then we're quiet and then maybe we read a story about little lambs and rabbits and then we go, you know, we kind of, 
put the music on and we put the lights down and we kind of get everything ready and maybe we should treat ourselves like that too. <laughs> totally, totally, Lorna. And you know, I think we, we are so used to, and we put a lot of effort into um, the routine that we start our day with, right? We, we get dressed in a certain way. Maybe you put on makeup, you put your earrings on, you put your perfume on, you know, you're playing your favorite music while you're getting dressed. And then when it comes to bedtime, at the very max, you brush your teeth <laughs> and then you just plop into bed. And I think we really need to think about the fact that we spend almost half of our lifetimes asleep. And the more we activate that part of our lives, the more we intentionally put aside time to make the most of our sleep time, the more rich our life awake becomes. I love that, actually. It's just once again, that kind of very circular idea of balance kind of coming in, in terms of that balance between sleep and wake and how better sleep makes for better awake time and vice versa. Um, so I think there was a question coming through, which I thought was quite interesting. You did touch on yoga nidra earlier. If you could just repeat, what is the best time in the day to focus on yoga nidra? So the amazing thing about Yoga Nidra is you can be completely alert and awake at the beginning of the practice. And at the end of the practice, it's usually about 30 to 40 minutes long. You are completely awake and alert again. But throughout that time, you're experiencing a deep level of rest, which is very similar physiologically to sleep. So the answer to that is you can do Yoga Nidra at any time. You can do it whenever you feel like you need to recharge. That can be in the middle of your day. It can be in the late morning. But it can also be really useful just before sleep. If you are someone who suffers from falling asleep or insomnia, very useful to do yoga nidra. And just allow it to play. You'll probably find yourself drifting off. Um, because you're doing it before bedtime, your brain almost takes that in and allows yourself to just continue into a deep sleep. But really, it's for any time. Um, and what I find really powerful about Yoga Nidra is that there's so many different recordings about this practice. Most of these recordings follow a specific script that helps you to relax your physical body, your emotional body, and your mental body as you go through those different stages. And it's also completely safe. Um, you know, some of these well-being practices are maybe not advisable if you're pregnant or if you have specific chronic conditions, but yoga nidra is safe for absolutely everybody. So definitely something that I would encourage, especially if you're struggling to sleep. And if you are one of those people who wake up um, unprompted in the middle of the night and you're struggling to fall asleep, that's another opportunity. Put your yoga nidra on and you'll probably find that you fall back to sleep a lot easier. Wow, that's a really nice practical tip um, to sort of just kind of give yourself that rest and recharge at any time during the day or even to incorporate as part of your sleep routine. So thank you for that. And thanks for the question. So I think that the last question that I wanted to ask was um, what about diet and supplements? Because we know that our body is a complex system. Everything is, in, you know, interrelated. And I think... A lot of people have possibly heard about the fact that magnesium is good for sleep. So what are the supplements that you often recommend to your patients or that just you would recommend here um, in terms of um, supporting better sleep? So I think when we think about the supplements that we're supposed to be using, most of these supplements are mirrored in the biochemistry of our brain. So the reason why you're actually taking that supplement is to give your brain an extra boost before you go to sleep, and that's what allows you to sleep more calmly. So magnesium is definitely a great one, and I find that magnesium gets forgotten about quite often, even though it's such a useful mineral to have. It affects our mus muscular function and our brain function. Um, so magnesium, absolutely. Calcium is another interesting one that not many people associate with the brain. We often think about it just for our bones, but it's really, really useful also for muscular health and brain health as well. Potassium is another one that I would recommend. And then I would say the omega um, supplements, omega-3 and 6, 
regardless of what source it is that you get it from, are generally extremely good for brain health, for memory, but also for that rejuvenation state that happens in sleep. So if we're looking at our minerals, those are the ones that I would recommend. There are also some really interesting supplements that contain melatonin. You have to be a little bit more cautious here because melatonin is a natural hormone that your brain releases according to your circadian cycle that helps you to sleep. So if you take in too much melatonin, it might actually decrease the amount that your brain is naturally secreting. So where you don't have your melatonin, you may have issues falling asleep. But there are a few supplements that have a very small amount of melatonin along with the other minerals that we've already spoken about that can just help give your brain that extra push that it needs, especially if you're already in a state of chronic fatigue, if you're somebody who's suffering from insomnia, for example. That might be a good option for you because your own melatonin levels might be depleted because of your fatigue, and so you might just need a little bit of a top-up to help your brain settle back into its circadian rhythm. Fantastic. Um, and I, I see that one of the questions that came up, um, thank you, Bradley, was around meditation. And so, um, you know, meditation also comes in, like yoga, comes in many different forms. Um, and that is probably a little bit different to yoga nidra. So what would you recommend in terms of meditation as a tool potentially to support sleep? Such a good tool. So I think when it comes to both yoga nidra meditation, and there are even some calming breathwork techniques that you can do that can help you to settle into a more restful state. The main key here is that we're distracting the mind from its thoughts. So when we talk about meditation specifically in this context, you probably want to be doing a guided meditation because an unguided meditation, the whole point of it is for you to be alone with your thoughts, aware of them, and to watch them. And if you're sleeping and your, ma your mind is going a mile a minute, that's probably not really what you want to be experiencing. So a guided meditation where you have somebody else talking you through a visualization, a body scan, um, a multi-sensorial experience, for example, is really useful because it distracts the mind from whatever it may be thinking about and brings you into that present moment. But in addition to that, often in guided meditations, because you are focused on a soothing, calming voice, your breathing rate automatically slows down. And that, just through your diaphragm, sends a message to your brain to switch off your flight or fight response and to put you into a more restful state of being. So you can achieve that, that message, essentially being sent from your diaphragm to your brain through taking long, deep breaths in your own pace. You won't need anyone to guide you through that. But I definitely recommend a, a calming guided meditation, perhaps a visualization or even someone telling you a story. I think, um, you know, I loved what you shared, Mona, about your kids and their bedtime routine. And I think with well-being, there's, there's a big part of connecting to our inner child, and connecting to things that brought us peace and calm when we were in childhood. And so listening to a story, a guided story, and, and experiencing that snuggle up, you know, and, and just being able to escape into an alternate world, I think as adults is something that, that we should really at least experiment and try to see whether that evokes those same peaceful memories of being read to as we fall asleep. So essentially mothering ourselves. I love that. I love that. <laughs> um, I just have a question coming through. Um, so in terms of supplements that can support sleep, it's, we now kind of know which ones are great to support sleep, but what is the optimal time to take them? Is it just before sleeping, an hour before sleep, half an hour? What's mm. the kind of recommendation? Generally, Generally, when it comes to vitamins and minerals, you want to be taking them so that they're released slowly throughout your day. Remember, our vitamins, especially if we are eating our supplements, which most of us are, um, need to be digested by our gut for them to be absorbed. And we already spoke about how when we start entering into that restful state of the circadian rhythm, our digestion is actually supposed to shut down. So that's why I don't think we mentioned it, but having 
your last meal a couple of hours before your bedtime is so mm. important so your body can digest the food but then go into a state of rest so you want to be taking your supplements at the very latest with your dinner but i would even recommend most of these are taken as one tablet per day it's not so much about it having a spiked effect after you've taken it but having a nice level amount of those minerals in your bloodstream as the day goes on so you can take it in the morning most of them do need to be taken with a meal and as long as your body levels of those minerals is optimal it will eventually affect your sleep you don't have to take them right before going to bed okay i love that and it's i think once again just that idea of balance so it's not about like a spike and a drop it's about kind of balancing the levels of those minerals in your body to support better sleep wake wake cycles going forward exactly exactly and because you know these the wonderful thing about the way our bodies work is they're very efficient so one mineral is used for lots of different things and we already spoke about how calcium, magnesium and potassium are good for your muscular function and your muscle recovery. So if you are someone who's very active, taking those supplements at the start of your day will also help with your muscle recovery and mm -hmm. activity during the day while also impacting on your sleep when you go to bed. Fantastic. So Anissa, I'm I'm just going to ask uh, everybody that's on with us if you guys have any final questions for Anissa before we sign off. And while we're doing that, is there anything that you'd like to kind of summarize for us that you think are really, really important in terms of thinking about circadian health, sleep, that you really want people to take away today? Mm, I think before we get to the summary, if you don't mind, Lorna, something that I'd love to share that I think has come from my personal experience is what we call sleep inertia that people experience right upon waking. And we spoke a little bit about the fact that if you're feeling irritable or groggy after waking, that that can be a sign that your circadian rhythm isn't quite up to scratch. But there is a completely normal human experience of getting up and feeling slow, tired, fatigued, <laughs> irritable for about 15 to 30 minutes right after waking. And That's I think really so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think it's really important to normalize that experience of maybe feeling a little bit anxious. Maybe you feel a little bit down in those first 30 to 45 minutes after waking, because that is your brain essentially shifting from that different wavelength that we spoke about to the more active wavelength that we need for waking. And so the reason why I wanted to mention that is because I think it's really important for us all to set aside at least the first 30 minutes, if you can make it the first hour of your day, great, to just dedicate that amount of time to waking up slowly, to allowing yourself time to maybe not be your best self. You know, if you're a morning person, your sleep inertia might just be five minutes. For others, it's a little bit longer. Um, but allow yourself that time and recognize that that's just your body asking you to have more time to gently reawaken. And that can be done by doing your guided meditation in the morning. Maybe you play some gentle music before you get things started, before picking up the phone. Um, just allowing that little pocket of time to be sacred, to gently wake yourself up from your sleeping cycle. So I just wanted to put that in there for the, the non-morning people. <laughs> I love that actually. I think that's really great advice, whether you're a morning person or not. Um, because I think most of us in this very high stress world we live in, it's kind of like jump out of bed, like kind of knock on the kids' doors, like scream into the kitchen, <laughs> like it's go, go, go from the first second. And maybe we're actually not doing ourselves any favors by doing that. Maybe we need to kind of be a little bit more gentle on ourselves during the start of our day. And hopefully that kind of translates into that same gentleness and empathy throughout the rest of the day. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think just to sum up, the, the main takeaway I think of our chat is that it's really important to see your sleep as the balancing aspect of your day-to-day -day life and to pay as much attention to your sleep as you do the wellness practices that you do during the day. Take some time to really observe how it is you are waking up, 
all the way to what it is that you do just before sleeping, slowly start taking away the things that we've discussed are not good, the blue light, the artificial stimulants, the external stresses, and bit by bit, you'll begin to notice what your natural circadian rhythm feels like, which is so helpful because if you are out of sync with that, you will immediately recognize it through you feeling a little bit irritable, fatigued, or tired. And we've provided a few of the tools like some guided meditation, a yoga nidra, um, or even some of the supplements that we spoke about that you can use once you notice that your rhythm is not quite where it should be. Fantastic. Anisu, thank you so much for your time. This has been a really wonderful chat. And thank you so much to everybody for your patience at the beginning. I know we had a few wobbles, but I think you'll all agree with me this, this conversation is certainly worth the wait. So thank you, Anisu, for your time. Keep well, everybody. See you on Thursday in beauty. Bye-bye.